You're listening to The Valley Current. Welcome into The Valley Current. But I wanted to turn your attention for a second from politics to this whole question of all these measuring devices that are coming out in smartwatches and continue to amaze how much data collection is happening. So I sent you that article about measuring telomeres. I don't know if you got to see it. And I thought, oh, this is really interesting because it seems as though people are are suggesting or hinting that there will be some sort of future device that will be outside the lab. I don't know if that's even possible. I wanted to get your comments on that, where somehow the way people take blood and use a glucose meter to look at their glucose levels, and they take a a blood pressure reading on a blood pressure device, and they take a oxygen level on these little finger oxygen devices, it seems as though all these smart watches are moving in the direction of loading more real time data collection about our biology, maybe not about the law of physics as it's applied to aging, but more like the biological uh, data that's out there. Do you see that as even theoretically feasible over the next, I don't know, 10, 20, 50 years? where these smartwatches get that capable? Or is it like, no, it's hard enough to measure inside of a lab in a, you know, clean place with high powered instruments. This is not, this is not something that you can imagine doing uh, in your home, nor would it necessarily reveal all that much data, but they're suggesting that maybe it would, right? Well, there, there are many things that exist at this moment that we never thought were possible even five or 10 years ago. Right. The the oximeter that you referred to. Right. Many other measurements. It's just a matter of the engineering required to miniaturize it to the point that it can exist on something as small as a watch. I don't think you can discount that. Right. Because we have miniaturization to a, to a degree today that we could never imagine before in respect to smartphones for example right and the and the and the battery the pa- the power sources seem to be seem to be getting smaller and more flexible people are talking about clothing uh, flexing into a power source so you could actually wear something that actually becomes a rechargeable battery and it's almost like woven into the fabric, so you're not carrying a heavy, a heavy battery or a heavy device. So it's kind of an interesting, an interesting time in electronics. And people want more and more data. Obviously, they don't necessarily pay attention to their diet or pay attention to the things that impact the data. But more and more, it seems like they want the data because they want to know more and more. Well, what's really going on? Uh, it, with respect to my biology. Now, we all know we age. We all sort of age at a different rate. I think you've done a great job over the last 90-something years. Isn't, didn't your birthday just happen? May. Okay, so you have a 93rd birthday coming up in May? Yeah. 93, so that's got to be like the top 1% for sure of men from your cohort. Cohort right? Your cohort, like, you know, the tables, the tables are all available online. And your mom, as I recall, lived to 107. Am I remembering that right? Six. 106. So you in her 107th year, but she was right. So she was 106 and change, right? So you could you could have a good solid 13 plus years ahead of you if you beat your mom, right? Yeah, the math is indisputable, but the biology is. Well, you might be in a better shape than your mom was at the age of 93. Maybe if you had the exact data, obviously I look at my mom and I've got a picture of my mom when she was first getting married in 1951, 70 years ago. And I compare that picture to where she is now 
And, you know, it's like, wow, what happens to the human body over a 70 year period? I mean, it's, it's inevitable. It's not like you can say there's exceptions to it. Uh, you can't find those exceptions, even among people that really super take care of themselves. The process of aging plays itself out, but people want to measure as much as can be possibly measured and telomeres seem to be the proxy that people believe exists. Now, you were the one who discovered this. Am I, am, I, am I correct in recalling this, correct? I discovered the phenomenon that resulted in the discovery that my phenomenological discovery could be explained by telomere attrition. So yes, I did not discover the molecular cause of what I had discovered but what I discovered overthrew a 60-year-old dogma, I proved that normal human and animal cells have a finite capacity to divide, which was later discovered by others to be caused by telomere attrition. And you can't get any closer to what you described than that. But um, I'd like to get back to another major point about measurements. I'm showing on the camera my mom on her wedding day next to my dad. That's my mom. And, and my dad right. is next to him. It was 1951. It looks like a movie, like a movie star. Yeah, not, 70 years ago, they both looked like movie stars. Black and white, of course, was the way people did pictures. And this is my mom at the age of 90. And of course, she was in the hospital recently. So this is a shot out of, of course, I can't quite get it to work. It's a, sh a shot out of the hospital bed. So it's, it's, it's not a great picture of her. It's obviously, you know, the deterioration of everything is playing out. And, you know, that's 70 years of whatever you want to call it, ultraviolet light, chemistry, you know, everything that bears on a person's body, you know, the, the thermodynamic instability, right? Everything starts to move towards entropy, right? Increasing entropy. Right. So, so I look at that and of course she's always saying daily that, Hey, it's time for me to go. And I don't know why I'm still here. I don't really get this. I can't really do anything. She's pretty much bed bound. She's certainly not active intellectually, you are. She's certainly not mobile, you are. She's certainly not cooking her own food, you do. She's certainly not buying her own food, you are. I mean, I can make a list, I'm sure it'd be a hundred items. And you'd say, yeah, um, it's an interesting comparison to think about people in their 90s and comparing what does it mean to get into your 90s and what happens to a lot of things as you get into your 90s? And you're probably a great example of someone who is way more productive than the average person that's in their 90s. I mean, you're retired, but you're really still very active and you're doing a lot of intellectual activities and you're totally well, I don't, engaged. I don't even know that I'm retired unless you can define that word for me. Right. Right. I, I almost bit my tongue when I said it because I was saying, well, I don't think Len is actually retired. I think he's, yeah, you, you manage your time well. You can do what you want to do. You can make choices. I mean, some people look back and say, man, I wish I could make the choices. I remember my dad saying, I wish I could make the choices I have the freedom to make, but I wish I could have done it when I was in my 20s. When, you know, it seems like there's so many other things that pile on. But when you look at this whole idea of measuring telomeres specifically, do you think that eventually leaves the laboratory context? I mean, the article I sent you was talking about how cortisol has some impact on telomeres. And we know cortisol tends to be produced as a result of stress. And it tends to sort of have all sorts of complications associated with it. And the reason I raise it is there's so much going on in Silicon Valley right now. Of still, biotech companies are getting funded, even in the course of the pandemic. People want to believe that 
longevity can increase if we just measure the right things and then we act on the measurements. Of course, there's a disconnect you know, between acting on the measurements and making the measurements. And there are definitely people that are doing a lot of measurements all the time. I mean, I think there are some people that do it just for sport and other people keep daily records kind of like, you know, as though they are some sort of athlete that needs to track their performance, like a golf score. And they treat their blood pressure and their oximeter numbers. And maybe they're worried about getting coronavirus. So that's the driver. I don't know. But I think all those devices have flown off the shelves of drugstores and the like, you know, you know, Walgreens and Longs and so on. Although Walgreens just closed in Palo Alto, literally it was there for like 50 years. The downtown Palo Alto Walgreens just closed up. It's literally an empty, empty building now. One in uh, Stanford Shopping Center? I think there is one or one smaller one somewhere, but the big store on the corner of University and I want to say Everett or one of the streets, the, it's a big corner, big corner store just a few blocks as you enter uh, University Avenue off of Palm Drive. When you take Palm Drive out of Stanford, heading towards 101 down Palm Drive to University and you get into University, one of the first big, really big chain oh, spot yeah. is, is Walgreens, but it's closed and it shocked people because they never thought that would happen. They never thought the big downtown drugstore. Now there's still a long drugstore, which I think probably is getting more of the business. Why did it shut down? I guess they felt like they didn't have enough business and they couldn't afford the rent. I'm guessing I, the story has not been completely told, but the place is empty. They've moved all the merchandise out and it's essentially an empty shell. I don't know who's going to go in it and what retail will go there, but retail of course is hurting generally. But getting back to this question of telomeres, do you think it's measurable outside the lab with the right with the right products? I don't know. You have to. You presumably have to draw blood and take some samples of different things, right? Don't you? Well, even though it's possible to measure changes in telomere length, despite the literally thousands of papers on what telomere loss or lessening, I should say, or reduction in length. What all that means is so confusing and has not yielded yet actually reliable ironclad facts of meaning. And it's like measuring any other attribute of biology in older people where the variation is so great that it's very difficult to determine underlying facts. So <clears throat> even, even if you could measure telomere length by some technical means that could be encompassed in a wrist in a watch size device, what it means is still unknown generally. Right, but if you if you start getting unreliable. Right, but if you start getting the data from enough people, I imagine some patterns might emerge. Let's say you got the data from people on a very long basis from when they were in their 40s to when they're in their 80s or 90s and you start to pay attention to well, hey, look these people that do yoga, their telomeres seem to shorten much more slowly because they are moving their bodies routinely from you know six in the morning to seven or seven thirty in the morning every day and causing some metabolic changes or acceleration to happen so that there's never any inflammation or the inflammation is lessening i mean you might see some pattern data there i'm just hypothesizing this i don't know if it's true or not your point is there haven't been enough sort of rigid scientific observations about, well, what does it mean to sort of compare the uh, rate at which telomeres shorten over time? They certainly don't lengthen. I don't think they ever lengthen over time, do they? As, as one gets older, they never lengthen, right? 
Well, they might in some cases, their evidence of the odd report, but the, the point is this, that there have been so many studies on this matter that its replication by many different laboratories has not yielded anything substantive that can be relied upon as a measure of anything. Just because one thing changes with age has no meaning whatsoever because everything changes with age, virtually everything. Right, there's too many whether, variables. Whether it's quantitatively increased or decreased, you can't select one of those variables, as many people have done wrongly, and claim, well, whatever X is that went up is what causes aging, or right. whatever X goes down causes aging. Well, everything goes either up or down. So making conclusions from that kind of data is virtually impossible. Right. I, mean, I, wanted, to, I wanted to get back to a measurement that's really astounding. Okay. Although it's not miniaturized to the point of capable of being incorporated into a wristwatch. And that is blood chemistry. Years ago, first of all, when you get a blood chemistry report, it contains, let's say, 40 or 50 items. Right of enormous accuracy. And that is done, and this is the important point, within 24 hours. Right. And it's done on a grand scale of hundreds of people being examined with their blood chemistry donations. Right. In a matter of 24 hours with 50 highly reliable results. Well, that's an astounding accomplishment and has rarely been paid attention to by people who should know better. And I'm the neither. reason the engineering that went into that, and a lot of it is actually engineering has to do with bubble movement, is an astounding accomplishment. Well, there's a big case. There's a big case in San Jose, we should remark at this point, against the founders and the CEO of Theranos, which was this major fraud case that had to do with them thinking, and it actually does tie to Walgreens too, because Walgreens agreed to set up these blood repository centers, not for donating blood, for actually doing the pinprick measurement of the blood sample that would right there on a little device the size of Tune in next on the Valley Current.